Hello everyone, my name is Andrew Hunt from The Bullvine. I'm glad you can join us today for our webinar, Help Calves Survive and Thrive. We've all had calves that maybe had health issues, respiratory issues, scours and diseases as heifers that just don't turn out as cows. They either don't uh, mature and get large enough in their milk capacity or they continue those health challenges into lactation. And uh, we would love to be able to identify these calves at an early age. And with that, we have the pleasure of have three individuals uh, from Zoetis with us today to help us uh, figure out just which how we can identify these issues and then there's been a lot of new wellness traits come to the market here lately and calf livability and so they're going to go over that with us today and it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Cheryl Marty, Dr. Dan Weigel and uh, David Erf with us today who will each uh, share further insight into that with us and I thought I'd pass it to Cheryl to start off. Well, great. Thank you so much, Andrew, for having us, and welcome, everybody. My name is Cheryl Marty, and I'm with Soletis in the marketing Hello. area for the best. Yep, can yep. you hear me? No, yes, I can. Okay, very good. Well, we're excited to share with you and talk about some of the new ways that Andrew mentioned that dairy producers can add to ways that they can improve the calves' ability to survive and thrive. So as you mentioned, years for years, that producers have been able to focus really only on calf management and nutrition to improve the calf and uh, health and wellness. So as we also know, calves represent a very important part of the herd's potential future, and thus it's really important to consider all ways that you can help keep them healthy to survive and thrive up until they start bringing you that profit after calving. So now we've added uh, a new dimension and way for whole seed producers to bring and produce a healthier group of calves in the herd, and that's through genetics and specifically the clarified plus genomic test. So today we're going to have a three parts to this, and um, I'll start off by briefly reviewing dairy wellness and the continuum of care and how we think of that from the Zoetis perspective and how it impacts producers. And then I'll have Dr. Dan Weigel review why and how the calf wellness traits were developed. And then finally, Dave Erk will discuss how producers can implement this uh, and improve wellness, productivity, and profitability with the new and revised indexes that are part of Clarified Plus. So if you're familiar with our organization, uh, Dairy Wellness is the center point and where we spend our energy and efforts in working with producers and influences in industry, as well as where our thoughts go to is when we, when we think about new products and services that we want to develop for dairy producers. There's three parts or three pillars that we focus on and consider as part of dairy wellness. The first is healthy animals. This is the heart of where we focus our efforts on providing the products, services, and the technical support to help achieve, with the end goal of having a healthier animal for producers. Next is healthy dairies, and this is really focused on the financial side and the financial health of dairies. While we certainly don't control milk, price, milk prices, we can help producers by working with their dairy management teams to improve the most important top line by increasing revenue from higher output and also help identifying some efficiencies they might have. Finally, having a safe product that you can, you as a dairy producer can sell as a healthy food product in the end is also a very important part of that, both for beef and dairy. And we strive to support producers and industry efforts in achieving this through educational and other efforts. What's exciting about this is that genetic improvement with genomic testing and strategies has an important impact in all of these areas, as genetics are foundational to the composition of herds, and the strategies impact the direction that herds move towards from there. So as we have let us also consider dairy wellness, there's a range of things that can go into creating and keeping an animal healthy. And we wish to be part of this continuum of care, starting as early in life as possible. Some may also still ask why we're getting involved in genomic testing, and that really goes back to our focus again on dairy wellness and our desire to be part of this continuum of care. And this can start in any species we work with, with the ability to predict 
genetic information that, in the case of dairy cattle, can help a dairy producer know if a young calf is a good investment to raise, and in this case, a clarified plus can additionally measure the risk of future disease in calves and cows. The important step to do then with genetic information or especially genomic information is to then plan a strategy so as to select for and then breed for a herd that has improved genetics over time for the improvement of that health and important performance trait. And this is where and why genomic testing has become a vital, uh, become vital to more and more dairy because it's an important opportunity for producers to proactively make more permanent improvements that can build on each other generation after generation. Next, it's important to continue to protect that investment with tools like vaccination that helps prevent the disease. And we have a wide variety of high quality vaccines to help improve the health of ages of all animals. Unfortunately, just like humans, animals also can still get sick. So being able to detect and help diagnose illnesses early and accurately is also important so as they can have a quick and effective treatment. So we continue to develop this area in various animal species. Finally, treatment is the last phase in this continuum of care that we can provide for. And producers like yourselves work very hard to minimize the number of animals that require medications to make them better. And so in doing all these things better, we believe that we can make a difference in dairy wellness and healthier animals, healthy dairies, and our consumers a healthier and safer food supply. So as we considered being an important contributor to the genetics industry and achieve our goals of providing valuable information to dairy producers in the future, we found out that tools we had available to build on were insufficient. So one of the important foundational things that we did recently on the dairy side was we sequenced the Holstein genome. This is the first and only dairy animal sequence to date and we did this on a Holstein bull. <clears throat> this was announced in February. Prior to this, we and everyone else in the industry have been using the bovine genomics uh, from a Hereford cow. Um, but as we learned, this map wasn't very clear or accurate. So having a Holstein bull sequence gives us the ability to better map regions of the genome that influence a range of health and disease outcomes. But in the end, will help promote advancement of the dairy industry through healthier, more productive animals. So how this was done was the genome was um, completed with several different new technologies, including three sequencing platforms to order the Holstein genome as accurately as possible. All of this is, of course, way above my understanding, but what's easier to understand for me is that with this new level of accuracy we have on the Holstein genome, scientists can now more easily identify genes that advance herd health and productivity, and know which genes also impede the progression. So if you think about an analog TV and going from that to a high-definition TV, it was like I, I learned a lot of new things about some of the movie stars that we saw on TV. Like they had more wrinkles than I ever thought they did. <laughs> so it's kind of like doing that. It's like opening up a whole new world that you may not have known about before. We now have better information and insight into which genes help animals resist and withstand diseases. So with this new technology, we are also looking for partners to work with who are interested in similar goals. And one planned collaboration we have, just as an example, is to create the full first sequence of the Y chromosome with an academic partner. And as you can remember, prior to this existing, um, we had a, we're basically working with the XX sex chromosome from a herd for cow. We look forward to this and other collaboration opportunities going forward. So as I shared that news about the sequencing of a Holstein genome, and I did that because it's really foundational helping us develop the new traits that you're going to hear about here, such as these calf wellness traits. And now I'd like to introduce to you Dr. Dan Weigel, who's been a strong advocate in helping bring new calf wellness traits to the market for producers. Dan is part of our outcomes research team, and he has a long history working in the dairy genetics field, as well as provide to be an active breeder of elite cattle. And so I don't want to steal any more of uh, thunder away from what Dan has to share. So Dan, it's all yours. Hey, thanks, Cheryl. Uh, as, you're, as you indicated, I've personally been really looking forward to having these calf uh, predictions uh, come to fruition, and, and I'm excited to share them 
with everyone today. Um, in everything we do at, at Zoeta, so we're, we're the first question we ask is, how does it impact our customers' bottom line? Our, our, you know, what is this project going to be economically important to our customers? And I think most of us will agree that you know calves are a significant investment in the future of our herds. And, you know, there's a couple of good uh, journal articles that kind of quantified that. Uh, uh, you know, Overton estimated that uh, about 8.6 percent of our total production costs in Holstein herds are due to uh, heifer replacements. Uh, Hendricks and co-workers showed that in some herds uh, that can get up to 15 to 20 percent of, of the total production cost. I think we all understand that the, these costs are influenced by calf morbidity and mortality, and, and it's not just the treating and the labor and the medicine. It's we know if we have calves that are compromised or we're losing calves, that means we have to keep extra calves, and that's uh, and especially in today's world, uh, carrying those extra heifers, uh, uh, making extra springers. Uh, is pretty expensive insurance uh, policy today. So we know that keeping calves healthy and, and minimizing death losses are key factors uh, for financial success of our dairies. Just to drill down on that just a little bit more, uh, one of the projects we, we did uh, with uh, CompPure uh, Financial, the uh, uh, cooperative lender for, um, here in the States, is we, we work with them to look at, uh, they collected what they call key performance indicators or KPIs uh, about their customers and, and they want to know how that those those indicators related to net farm income of their clients and so this uh, in this uh, analysis we did it was pretty insightful what came out of it the, the strongest correlation the strongest predictor of net farm income was net herd replacement costs again you can see on the footnote how that is calculated it's basically your dis difference between what it costs you to produce a replacement cow or heifer and less what you're getting for your 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 uh, sale of your cull cows or or the, how many cows you lose, and you divide that by your average milk production in hundredweights. So we express this as a dollars per hundredweight. Again, that negative correlation indicates that the, the higher the net herd replacement costs those customers had, uh, the less they made for net farm income. So clearly these uh, cow and calf wellness traits are pretty strongly related uh, to that outcome. Again, we all know, understand the second 121-day preg rate very strongly correlated as preg rates go up. Uh, we definitely see a, a strong uh, improvement in net farm income. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody. And again, we, we know we make a lot of progress for a pregnancy rate with our dairy wellness profit dollars index uh, today. Then the next one is heifer survival rate. Again, uh, a very strong. Again, this is the, the rank of all the indicators we looked at. Uh, this is the rank of, of their co correlation, absolute correlation in that farm income. So coming in number three is, is calf livability, scours, and respiratory disease obviously have a big impact on heifer survival. And so having these, uh, including these uh, new traits in our dairy wellness profit dollars, is absolutely going to make a difference to the net uh, to the financial success of our, our customers. All right. Again, so if you look at uh, so since, since we understand we want to improve this uh, these outcomes and, and and reduce morbidity and mortality, what how are we doing as, as an industry? So this is data from the National Animal Health Monitoring System uh, uh, that USDA conducts. Uh, every periodically for the industry. And so what we have here uh, on the left are the 2007 survey results, and then the next bar would be the 2010 survey results. Again, we've got just a little bit of different focus in the operations that they focused on. The first one was all operations, and the second was custom raisers. But you can see uh, in the pre-weaning uh, survey data, we saw a decrease in the death rate, but certainly the treatment, the morbidity rates went up quite a bit. Now that may be offsetting, may have helped to lower the mortality, but certainly we're treating a lot of calves uh, according to the survey. Again, then we look at the, the, the post weaning uh, information there, uh, we see the we, that uh, we still lose and treat a significant number of calves in, in our industry. Just to drill down to that just a, a little bit, uh, or uh, look across more, more studies, We'll see a, a wider uh, 
literature search here shows what the incidence of pre-weaning uh, uh, diseases here in the, in the far left column. You see the scat calf scours affecting uh, a significant number of our animals, uh, pre-weaning 23 to 20, uh, 25 percent. Uh, calf respiratory disease pre-weaning, again, well in, in the teens, and calf mortality, a big range there in the, in the literature estimates from 4 to 12 percent. Look at post-weaning, obviously scours is much less an issue post-weaning, uh, but then respiratory disease uh, is still a fairly strong uh, incidence in our industry, and then mortality continues to be an issue. And look at the cost of those diseases, both pre-weaning and post-weaning, again, uh, uh, pretty str uh, strong cost of scours, mostly uh, labor and, and, and supportive care, uh, but certainly a lot of time and effort required there. And then finally, we look at the mortality risk. Uh, again, a cap of scours is two and a half times more likely to die than one that does not. And the same, with, uh, pretty close to the same for respiratory disease. So again, we know these diseases and, and, and outcomes are, are fairly expensive, and so we, we really want to get after them. Just to drill down to the mortality just a little bit more, uh, just graphically showing this. Here's scours, uh, pre-weaning, 56% of the, of the pre-weaned heifer deaths are due to scours. And surprisingly, we see you know 13% of them are still responsible for the post-weaning heifer deaths. So that's, a, that's still a pretty, pretty big percentage of, of, the, of the losses are due to that disease. Uh, again, pretty, pretty prevalent, pretty high cost. Uh, pretty big impact on mortality. As we look at respiratory disease, we see you know 25% of those calves, 23% 20, of those calves uh, that die pre-weaning are due to respiratory disease. And clearly, as we shift to post-weaning, it becomes the number one reason heifers leave at 46%. We also see that unknown, and the purple there is a significant fact uh, amount of uh, uh, mortalities. So having just an overall livability outcome is certainly warranted by this data. So again, uh, as you've probably picked up from all of this, uh, uh, as of March 1st, we, we are changing our Clarified Plus uh, offering uh, in addition to providing the CDCB evaluations, all the full parentage and production fertility and all the other traits that we get with that traditional CDCB offering uh, and the cow wellness traits of mastitis, lameness, metritis, retained placenta, displaced abomasum and ketosis. As of March 1st now with Clarify Plus, we also include the calf wellness traits of calf livability, calf respiratory disease, and calf scours. And as Dave Erf will talk about later in the seminar, uh, we're going to take this all this information and reformulate our dairy wellness profit dollar animal ranking index to include all these traits uh, to make it easier for our customers to use that information properly. Just to define these traits a little bit more uh, granular for you, again, well, as our reports come out, you'll find that column, the, the trait will be labeled with a Z in front of them. Uh, as Andrew in indicated, we're having more health traits available to the industry now, so we're going to put a Z in front of our traits to make it very clear which is, uh, which, is which. And again, so livability will be Z calf live. Again, in the States, uh, we record the daughter's st uh, stillbirth information. We define that as any calf that dies within the first 24 hours of life. So we don't want to double count those calves. So our, our recording period for our livability trade starts at day two and goes through the first uh, 365 days of age. Again, we look at our in incidence of the, the data we have. Uh, we're working with to develop these uh, evaluations. It's a little bit lower than some of the other uh, survey data. Probably reflects the quality of the customers that, that we have. Uh, they're doing a little bit better job than the rest of the industry, but still 4.7% of our calves are lost during this period. Again, we're not counting those calves lost as stillbirths here. Again, we've got uh, close to 2 million records involved in our record, uh, in our evaluation today, and the heritability estimate we have currently is at 6%. On the next line, we've got Z-calf resp for a respiratory disease, and that does start at day zero and goes through 365 days of age. And the incidence uh, in our data set today, again, we're only counting the, at least one case. So this is not the total number of cases we observe here. This is how many, what percent of the calves had at least one case of, of respiratory disease? And we're at 17.3% of our calves. 
and we've got uh, 1.3 million records uh, at the present time. The heritability of that trade is slightly lower at 0.042, for 4.2% heritability. And finally, we've got scours here. We're going from day two to 50 days of age, and we hope our, our customers are giving a, a big a slug of colostrum at birth, and, and we don't want to have any confusion about uh, uh, what that uh, first uh, bowel movement, if that scours or not. We're going to start at day two to do that, and we're going to go through 50 days of age. Again, if we only consider how many calves had at least one case of scours, we're still at uh, over 20% of our calves are affected. You know, not as many of our customers record this outcome. It typically is not treated with antibiotic therapies, uh, so we, we see a little bit lower recording in our data set. We, we wish that was not the case, but uh, it, that is reality, and our heritability is at 4.5%. Again, finally, the bottom line here that tied us all together, uh, we have uh, 451,000 genotypes available for consideration in our uh, value as of, of January of 2018. Again, putting these traits together, uh, uh, it, it's the same. It was the same process we used for our cow wellness traits. It took a, uh, it was a total team effort. Again, we had to go out to our customers and ask them, "Hey, will, will you uh, give us permission to use this written permission to use your data in developing these predictions to help the industry move forward?" Uh, and we had to uh, use the uh, genotypes that we got through our, our genotyping business. Uh, to come up with these marker estimates, be able to do our marker estimates. And we also had to build pedigrees to tie this all together using uh, the data that was available on the software that the, the producers had or through the, the that came back uh, as part of the gene typing process. Again, it took a lot of resources, a big team. We had our field staff collecting this data. And obviously, we have a very strong research group uh, that uh, did all the work to uh, do the analysis and, and decide which traits we could do and to uh, conduct the routine genetic evaluations that we run now. Again, just to ref remind everyone how we defined our wellness traits. Uh, again, we call these standardized transmitting abilities. Uh, each, as you saw, you know, livability has a much lower uh, incidence than, than the other two diseases. So how do we compare them? And the answer is with a standardized transmitting ability. And in our case here, we're going to set the breed average to 100. And the standard deviation of that, of that uh, prediction will be five. Again, for your, for your type traits from the Holstein Association today, that's a, another example of a standardized transmitting ability. Uh, in that case, you know, the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. So if you have a, a heifer that's uh, plus one for type, you know that she's a full standard deviation above the population average. In our case, a full standard deviation above uh, is, recommend, is five, so that's a heifer that's 105. Again, in our case, we want a, a higher number to be more desirable. Uh, so for respiratory disease, scours, and, and, and livability, just like the cow traits, that represents uh, animals that are more likely to stay healthy and, and, in this case, stay alive. Yeah, just to look back, uh, you know, we, we have the same methodology here we're using for these calf traits as we did for the cow wellness traits. And, and hopefully, some, most of you have seen uh, the, the data that we've published on this, on these uh, outcomes, and how well they're performing for our customers in the field. Uh, that we have an article in the Journal of Dairy Science with a uh, Levin herd study uh, by McNeil and, and coworkers. Uh, there was, it was over 3,000 cows. Here's a, a smaller study uh, of 1,292 heifers that were in three herds that were not contributing data to our to our system when when uh, we ran this analysis. So these predictions are clean from the resulting phenotypes. Again, it's, it's, but the results are the same as we saw in, in the Journal of Dairy Science paper, a much larger study. If we look at those heifers in, in the in the bottom 25 percent uh, of the of the her, of these herds, uh, we can see that the, you know, the incidence uh, the rate of metritis was 33.9 percent. Contrast that with the top 25 percent of the heifers for this this uh, prediction, again, we went to these herds and took a genomic sample, took it back to the lab and predicted uh, whether or not they would have metritis. And if we look at that top 25%, we can see that half, they have half the disease incidence of the, of the bottom 25%. And we can debate about the economics and, you know, uh, the labor availability and the pressure we have for antibiotic therapies, uh, but clearly this is, this is a good thing for our industry to reduce 
the incidence of these outcomes in our, in our herds. And again, I'm really excited uh, for us to be able to use the new calf traits uh, to go after that area of our of our business. Um, so again, just to give you a picture of these STAs, uh, if you standardize them, they should look pretty standardized. And here's here are the three traits: livability, respiratory disease, and scours, showing the standard deviation, uh, the mean of 100, and the standard deviation of five. Uh, you do see here that the standard the livability. We do have some low animals in the industry, um, quite low. Again, a few. They have a low incidence trait, and, and uh, you succumb to this outcome, uh, the, the model will pull that, that prediction quite low. So again, we go from 66 to 116, that's some outliers there. Just to look at the reliability, what kind of reliability uh, predictions uh, we have with this. Again, this is from our one-step software, so these reliability predictions are the same as with the cow traits. And you can see with the lower heritability and, and the lower uh, 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 amount of data we have here, we have slightly lower reliabilities. Uh, for re livability, and we have the highest average reliability of 42%. And standard deviation, of all three of the, these outcomes are about 6%. So you can see if we look at the, you know, the, hef the heifers that have the, the in the bottom 5% of our of our percentile of our heifers. Again, these are heifers without phenotypes contributing to the data. Uh, we see that um, the, the bottom 5% would be about 32% reliability, and, and the top. Uh, 95th percentile would be at 51% of reliability. And go to the list here, 36% for respiratory disease and 39% average reliability for scours. In the next graph will show us that in a more visual uh, format, we can see here the, the bars in the red are the respiratory disease centered around 36% reliability <clears throat> and, uh, and the other two traits uh, centered a little bit higher. Uh, at 39 and 42 percent reliability. Again, we can see that the vast majority of our calves are going to have some pretty reasonable uh, reliabilities. Again, we've never had any information about these traits before, so this is a big, big step forward for us. Just to illustrate how much, uh, how little information we had about these traits before, here are this. Uh, chart shows the traits we found that had the highest absolute correlations to the three traits. Again, the highest absolute correlations. So again, the blue bar here is, is a CDCB trait of cow productive life, how long the cow stays in the herd. And we can see that the correlation to that trait, to the calf trait of livability, is actually uh, very low. Again, I, most people would consider a, a moderate correlation to be 0.4. Uh, we're not anywhere close to that. We're, we're not very correlated uh, to anything else we have. Again, livability is even less correlated, about 0.15 uh, to calf livability. Uh, so again, we really didn't have much information to go on at all uh, with predicting uh, these traits with the existing traits we had today. Same with respiratory disease. Uh, the traits are very low, uh, lowly correlated with other traits, and finally scours over the right. We really didn't know much about these traits um, of course, that I can, I can tell you that means that uh, today, when we rank on a trait such as TPI or net merit, or even the previous dairy wellness profit dollars, we really had no very little predictive ability. And animals that were at the very top of our list are just as likely to be poor for these calf wellness traits as they are to be good. So that is a pretty tricky situation to be in, but. It makes again, it reflects how important these new traits what will be to have as we go forward. Again, a lot of people ask, what are the correlation between calf livability and stillbirth? Did we break that correlation up? And yeah, we did. And once we get beyond a day of age uh, and look at the rest of the 364 days of that first year, we don't have a very strong correlation to, to the calves that die at birth or during the first day. All right, so it's my pleasure to turn over the rest of the, the talk uh, to my good friend and colleague, Dave Irv. All right, Dan, thank you very much for that. And what I'm going to talk about is, uh, like any new information that comes in, we need a way to put it to work out in the field. And so I'm going to talk about uh, the uh, new and revised indexes that we're going to use in Clarified Plus. So like I said, 
having information with no way to incorporate it into an overall index makes it uh, information that's hard to use. So uh, with the new CAF traits, we developed uh, uh, one new index, and that is called the CAF Wellness Index. It looks at those three diseases that we talked about, the respiratory disease, scholars, and then calf livability. And it reports them in dollars, and we place emphasis on them uh, by the importance of that trait in overall profitability. As you can see by this slide, that calf livability gets the biggest weight uh, at 43%. If we lose that calf along the way, it's a pretty big economic impact. Uh, when we look at uh, respiratory and scours, they get 29 and 28% of the index respectively. Both those diseases, uh, scientific literature tells us they make big impacts on future profitability of animals. So any improvements we can make there are going to be economically important. So remember, calf wellness is reported in dollars. Now, when we look at the distribution of our calf wellness index, over our, uh, our reference population here, we can see that we get some distribution out there. Uh, for our reference population, the mean was a negative $12 on the CAF Wellness Index, and we had standard deviations that uh, got us uh, quite a bit of variety. We went from the 10th percentile being at negative 55 to the top 10% uh, starting at $29. So uh, we get some spread with this information. So we've got some variation out there in our bloodline. As Dan pointed out before, uh, we don't have a trait in our arsenal right now that we're looking at that addresses calf wellness very well. So with the incorporation of the calf wellness index, uh, we've got a uh, an index that is more correlated to uh, these traits so we can uh, work at improving them. So when Dan talked before about the low correlation of productive life and uh, cow livability to these traits, now with the CAP Wellness Index, you can see that our correlations are now uh, 0.6 to 0.8 for the three new traits we've got. And when we look at the CAP Wellness Index, and look at its correlations to uh, cow livability and productive life, you can see those are uh, still pretty low and not what we'd consider uh, moderate or high correlated uh, 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 traits with calf wellness. So when we look overall at the calf wellness index, uh, keep in mind that heifer replacements are a big expense on the dairy and our top reasons for uh, early death. And now we've got the ability to have uh, some information to improve future uh, genetic selection for healthier Holstein calves. Uh, basically, as Dan pointed out, this is new information. And with new information presents new opportunities. We all want to do the best at raising our calves and getting as many of them to uh, uh, as uh, uh, to live to entering the milking herd as possible. Now we've got the ability to not only do our best on the management side, but put a genetic selection on that uh, on those calves to get them there. The reliabilities, as Dan said, are 36 to 42 percent for these new traits, and none of the current CDCB traits are very correlated to calf livability. So it's new information. And the genetic differences in uh, lifetime profitability are uh, attributed to differences in the calf. Uh, disease and mortality risk that we see is incorporated in the calf wellness index. So with the addition of the calf wellness index, we wanted to work that in to our overall uh, index called the Dairy Wellness uh, Profitability Index, and that was originally launched in March 2016. So now with the March 2018 uh, information, 
We're going to take this opportunity to update the Dairy Wellness Profit Index. Uh, we take our cues from uh, uh, the industry is that uh, we've had some uh, changes we've wanted to do, but you save up your changes and get them done at one time. It seems to create less confusion than always tinkering with an index. Uh, we reserve the right to always tinker with it if we, if it uh, warrants it, but we want to keep the changes to a minimum. So we're taking the opportunity here to make some changes. We're going to add the calf wellness trait, so calf livability, respiratory disease, and scholars are going in to the Dairy Wellness Profit Index. We're going to add in uh, the cow livability trait. We hadn't done that uh, yet, so that's going in. When we updated some economic values on our wellness trait, so there's going to be a slight, slight revision to the wellness trait index out there. So I'll tackle the last part first, the wellness trait index, and it's been modified. Remember that the wellness trait index is an economic index. It's reported in lifetime profit of dollars on the risk or less risk of those six uh, cow diseases, and it also includes an economic incentive for uh, selection of animals with the pole genotype, which is the only index I know out there that puts a uh, economic value on the pole in on the pole gene. Uh, the relative emphasis changed a little bit here. Uh, mastitis went up a little bit. Uh, we always said when we introduced it, we were a little conservative on the cost of uh, impact of mastitis economically. So uh, that was adjusted a little bit. So it still gets the lion's share at 47%. Uh, mastitis is our most common occurring disease in dairy animals, and it's our most expensive overall disease. So it warrants that uh, uh, big portion of the wellness trade index. Lameness comes in second at 25, nitritis at 15. Uh, DAs and RPs at 7 and 5, respectively, and ketosis in at 1%. Now, remember, with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, it's a comprehensive selection index. So it takes into account all the areas we're looking at here. So you can see on the right with the uh, uh, pie chart that what the weighting is on each of those areas. Uh, it's developed using standard selection index theory. So what we found there when we ran it through, we've got 32% on production. Production's still number one. The cow wellness traits come in at 25%. The new calf wellness traits will come in at 8% of our overall index. The longevity uh, part of it at 19%, that includes uh, productive life, livability, somatic cell, daughter stillbirth, and calving ease are all in there. 10% uh, on functional type, which is a moderate body size, and some on other composite and foot and leg composites in there. And then 6% is on reproduction. And that's where I take a lot of questions when I travel around the country for Zoetis, is you guys only have 6% on reproduction. We'll get to see later in one of our slides what the impact of the wellness traits has on looking at reproduction. Uh, just remember that this is the same economic assumptions on the uh, outside the wellness traits that the net merit formula has on theirs, and our economic values uh, come from scientific literature for the cow and calf wellness traits. And once again, through the uh, in here the well. Uh, there is a slight economic incentive for selection of animals with the old genotypes. Now, when we look at the uh, variation that we get with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, it really spreads cows out more. Uh, you see here with our uh, reference population from January that our mean was $335, and we had a standard deviation of $242. So we actually, with all this additional cow and calf wellness information, can spread those animals out a little more extreme as to who will likely be more profitable and who will be less profitable overall. And 
and that standard deviation part is huge. When we look at uh, what the uh, the uh, profitability we can use with the dairy wellness profit index versus the net merit formula really comes into play. And we can see that with the dairy wellness profit index at 242 standard deviation, that gives us the ability to uh, uh, do better selection, more accurate selection over time. Comparing the Dairy Wellness Profit Index with the Net Merit Formula, you can see here, as I said, we can spread those animals out more. With that bigger standard deviation, we can more accurately identify which animals uh, go to the bottom, which animals go to the top. Uh, the thing to remember with uh, the Net Merit Formula when comparing it to Dairy Wellness Profit Index is that uh, with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, we will re-rank animals a little bit with this. Not saying we're going to turn them upside down. The correlation between the two is around 0.9. Uh, so when I'm out in the field looking at herds that are got a group they're going to call that's on the bottom or a group they're looking at that's, uh, say, in the bottom 10% or the top 10%, usually uh, about 20 to 25% of those animals will change between those two indexes as to who's in and who's not. So it will re-rank animals and it will more uh, rely, more uh, give us more spread and let us know which animals are on those extremes. Now when we look at placing equal emphasis between net merit and the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, uh, and in this uh, example here we put one standard deviation of emphasis on each of them, we look to see where uh, did we make progress at? Where did we uh, go ahead and uh, move forward? And as you can see, we, on milk production, we gave a little bit to uh, the net merit formula. You know, but looking at that, you can always uh, kind of explain that and say that what are we looking at overall when we're saying we're going to make less progress on milk production? And what we see here is that, yes, we'll drop about 50 pounds of uh, uh, PTA milk, but think about if we get less sick animals, will more of that milk we make be able to be put in the tank? So my, uh, my assertion with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index is that we will be able to get more saleable milk from those animals. Uh, when we look down, productive life is pretty steady. Livability, we make a uh, nice gain on advancement for livability with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index. You can uh, say that uh, moving livability into our index and coupling it with selection for uh, less disease gives us animals that are going to have a higher likelihood of uh, leaving the herd alive rather than being cows that die along the way. We stay pretty steady. I'd like to point out DPR, we make a little bit more progress with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, even though it has a lot less emphasis on DPR in it. Think about those uh, cow wellness traits. Uh, Think about uh, calves that uh, have pneumonia when they get into the milking herd, what their reproduction is like. Usually those are your poor animals. And when we look at the wellness traits, both cow and calf, this is where we start to really see the impact here. Mastitis, big gain with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index. Lameness, a big gain. Also, uh, retained placentas is a pretty big gain. And then the three uh, calf uh, traits that we're looking at, calf livability, we make a big gain there. Calf respiratory, the net merit formula is pretty neutral on uh, improving respiratory. Now with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, we're going to make start making some gains there. When we look at uh, the economics of using the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, uh, here we have a, uh, a value uh, graph on the return that you'll get using net merit versus the Dairy Wellness Profit Index. 
Uh, it assumes that we're getting the uh, net merit for a much steeper price than the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, but yet the Dairy Wellness Profit Index gives us more return. And this is just on a culling strategy. And if we uh, work in the uh, next generation, when the progeny are considered, the differences definitely grow as we reproduce those animals that have much better uh, dairy wellness profit index, put more emphasis on those animals that have the best chance of making the next generation better. So in summary, when we look, Clarified Plus uh, was the first commercially available dairy genetic evaluation designed for cow wellness traits based on U.S. Holsteins. Now we're adding calf wellness traits to that. And so now we can uh, help uh, producers make more progress on the genetic side on their, for wellness and help them reach their profitability goals. And remember that direct selection is better than using indirect methods. Uh, we didn't go over that much here, but uh, looking at past uh, uh, experience we've had with trying to make progress on traits out there, having direct uh, information is much better. Uh, as Dan pointed out, the six key financial drivers, we can impact them all with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, uh, and we can uh, minimize disease risk. There's fewer treatments, lower mortality, all things that are big considerations that producers should make and our consumers are demanding out there. And Remember that the uh, ranking with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index versus the Net Merit Formula, uh, they'll change out there. But now the Dairy Wellness Profit Index allows us to make improvements on those important calf traits. I'll just remind people that we're not uh, emphasizing here that you're going to test these calves and make decisions to avoid uh, a lot on scours and respiratory on those calves right away because there is a time there to get the information back. But if you're making breeding decisions, now your resulting progeny that you make, if you're placing emphasis on these wellness traits, you'll start to slowly uh, work some progress into those uh, scours and pneumonia cases right away on those calves that are being born from those meetings you're doing. So the inclusion of calf wellness traits into DWP allows us uh, an easy-to-use comprehensive selection index that you can exclusively get through Clarified Plus. Uh, we've got more characteristics in, that affect lifetime profit. Uh, remember, animals rank differently than with the net merit formula, and we get more genetic variation, and that allows us to make more progress. And with the use of the Dairy Wellness Profit Index, producers can make more profit, even when the test cost is a little bit higher than a net merit-based ranking. And producers can use uh, the Dairy Wellness Profit Index to make all of their selection and breeding decisions, whether it's on heifers, which cows do they reproduce now, or which animals get uh, the chance to make the next generation, or which ones don't, and which bulls they select with the Dairy Wellness Profit Index. So anyhow, it's exciting information. We're glad to bring it out to the field. And I'm going to turn it back to Andrew for questions now. And just a reminder to everyone, you can either enter the questions in the chat box or you can email them to us at webinars at the uh, We have had about 10 or 11 questions come in already, so we'll start working away. Uh, the first question says, what breeds will the new traits be available for? Today it's just the uh, the whole team breed. Okay. And uh, also the follow up question that ties to that one is: Will it be expanded to other countries, or is it just U.S. data at this time? Today it is just the U.S. Um, we are looking um, strongly at other countries. Uh, we've been conducting uh, studies in other countries to you know we want to make sure that it's going to work in other locations as well. So. Um, I guess uh, stay tuned. 
Okay. Another question, Cheryl, you could or someone can answer the quick one. I know you've referenced it, but it was, came in here a couple times. Is what is the data source for these evaluations? Dan, you want to cover that one? Yeah, it's, it's our customers. Uh, they know that that uh, we are we our field staff uh, and veterinarians work with every day uh, on trying to improve their their animal health outcomes on their dairies. As Cheryl. Uh, talked about that's our that's our everyday job that is helping our customers with uh, protocol development and compliance with treating these uh, following those protocols for, for animal health. Uh, number one for preventing as much disease as possible, and how and then uh, the protocols for treating those that, that do have disease. So uh, we work with those customers every day, and we ask them, uh, hey, we got this uh, project we're working on. Uh, would you be willing to sign this consent form for our, our, their data to be used? And uh, if they agreed, you took a backup of their farm software, and that is where the data came from. Andrew, are you there yet? Yeah, sorry, I had a technical issue there for a second that I had to solve. Okay, and then a follow-up question that came in and that caused my technical thing, then I switching back and forth is, what would it take to offer this to other breeds? A question just came in there as a follow-up. Yeah, I mean, you can see that it takes a lot of data, right? These are health event traits, um, so we have millions and millions of records. So there may be some breeds that, you know, this might not be very feasible to get reliability levels that we're comfortable with. Um, so, you know, they're, of course, so I would imagine the next largest breed would be Jersey. So um, I don't know what uh, the other breeds are, but again, it, it takes a lot of records, a lot of information and cooperation uh, from the uh, breed association is also helps. It's not required, but that would also be very helpful. Okay. And then thank you for flipping to this slide. Um, and it just someone asked for a clar uh, clarification in the calf wellness dollars. It says, aren't calf livability and calf scours counted twice, or is, or was livability corrected for these traits? And so mm -hmm. the formula is here. Dave or Dan, do you want to take that? Well, yeah. The, the so livability obviously gets the most weight because it's a big, a big uh, outcome, right? If when we lose an animal, that's, that's a that's a pretty big outcome, a negative outcome. Uh, the other two traits are weighted by, based on their, their treatment costs and the labor uh, that they have. Again, so we, we try our best not to double count things. Um, but uh, again, we, uh, for example, we're not uh, really looking at uh, down the road uh, for decreased production uh, because we feel like that is gathered. This is a, you know, these calves when they have these severe events uh, as a calf. That's a permanent environment effect. It affects every Every day that heifer, heifer milks, uh, it's going to affect her production. So that the milk uh, PTA will capture that that loss of, of milk. Now, uh, we probably were a little conservative on how much uh, uh, we uh, looked at uh, losses. It's tough to get our, our hands on culling. Uh, you mentioned Andrew. You know, these heifers that start off and just simply don't have it right. And, and we know some of these are, you know, I've analyzed enough feedlot data from Holstein steers getting killed that uh, that uh, I'm sure their sisters have lung lesion data, lung lesions as well, because certainly their uh, the steers do, and they had this a lot of times the same environment as calves. So we know that there's issues there. Uh, we're, we're probably being fairly conservative on our on our assignment, especially for respiratory disease. What is the, what is the economic loss of that, these, these culls that we probably, our system doesn't capture well, very well. If they don't show up for a test um, uh, of milk weight, we, we don't uh, really capture those animals very well today. All right. Thank you. And then a question actually about three or four different variations of this question came in and is, um, how do you explain the low correlation to things like productive life and livability? Um, a few questions came in because you said it, uh, the, da the data is very opposite to that. So some people I think are confused that the, since they don't correlate with the trait like productive life, that there's a problem with one of the setups or one of the indexes or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll I'll jump in on that one. It's it's that it isn't that 
there's a problem with productive life it's or livability. It's just measuring those animals once they enter the milking herd. What we're looking at with these calf traits is we're looking at a different time in life where we don't have uh, as much uh, information out there flowing into our national database. So it's uh, what we found uh, from this information is that there's not much correlation with the cow traits uh, on predicting which calves would get sick with scours, <laughs> respiratory, or which calves won't survive. So I'm, we're not saying there's a problem with the traits out there. We're just saying that this is new information that's not correlated with that. So we can't use productive life to predict which animals are going to uh, uh, be the ones that die uh, sooner as calves. Or we can't use uh, livability to help us say which animals are going to get uh, pneumonia. So we need this. These traits are new information. It's things we're not currently looking at now in our indexes. And maybe to add to that too, I mean, you think about what what is productive life heavily related to, and there's a lot of reproductive traits that are highly correlated to it. Um, somatic cells highly correlated to it. And that, you know, those really aren't part of what happens in calves. And livability in a cow, you know, if you get a cow that gets sick after she calves, it gets one of the fresh cow diseases, that highly impacts her livability. Um, and, you know, whether you sell her for, for beef or, you know, you don't get any salvage value out of her um, versus a calf, you have different diseases that impact it. So I guess I'm not too surprised that it's different, you know, with all the things that Dave said and, just thinking about the what the stresses are and the things that are related to the existing traits that we have. Okay. And the next couple of questions kind of correlate on how producers would actually use this information. I know uh, one question came in is, you know, most of these incidences are going to occur in calves before we actually get the test results back, depending on what age you're testing your calves at. Um, so, Dave, you could maybe, if you don't mind going over again, just how this would be used in a breeding strategy or in your uh, your strategy that way that it's not necessarily uh, to make cull decisions, but how it could be used. Right. If if we look at the these calf traits and we look at when uh, they occur, it's darn hard to take a genomic sample, get it in, get results back, and not already have part of the animal's been exposed or had these diseases. So what we're what we're touting with this that you get an earlier return on your genomic investment is that that next generation that you make those heifers that you breed that you use the dairy wellness profit index and you're placing some emphasis on reducing these calf diseases that those calves that are born you're going to start to get that benefit right right away. As soon as they're born, you're going to start to see a little less scours, a little less pneumonia, a few more calves surviving because we're placing emphasis on these traits. So we don't have to wait for that next generation to enter the milking string to start seeing the fruits of our uh, genomic testing efforts. We get to see it on them as calves because these traits occur uh, earlier in life. If If someone's trying to use this information to say that those calves I test, I'm going to get less scours in them, you're, you're, we're not touting that. That's too quick to, uh, get a, uh, to get the information back to make much of an impact. Okay. I think on the end, Dave, would you say through then, I mean, you basically use the same information the same way you are today. If, they, if you're in a culling situation, you continue to use dairy wellness profit dollars to make that decision which has a little bit of those traits in it, and then the breeding decision to use dairy wellness profit dollars again to incorporate that in that. Would that be correct? Yes. And, you know, with uh, with the calf livability being uh, to one year of age, you're definitely going to see some of those, uh, uh, if you're doing some culling decisions on calves, uh, you're going to impact some of that those post-weaning uh, calf mortality issues, you're going to start to attack those right away, too. So I'm not saying it's not going to have any impact right away, but we're not touting that, oh, you're going to improve your 
scour's respiratory and livability uh, information right away. It's, uh, it's uh, on that next generation is where we're going to see the biggest impact, but on that next generation, we don't have to wait for them to enter the milking herd. Thanks, and you actually answered about three or four of the questions that were following on with that that people had sent in. And I think uh, one of the things, and I think you answered it a bit there a bit, is we're in a information age, and there's so much information, and it's great information, and companies like Soetis are great about helping bring new information into our programs, but it is that incorporating that information and how to use it at the farm level that uh, a lot of producers are working on getting their head around and how they can uh, make their breeding and culling decisions. Um, with that, there's a couple questions here. You, you mentioned about the greater distribution in dairy uh, wellness profit dollars and then about changing in, in would obviously I would assume some changing in rankings that would come with that. Is it a significant changing of rankings? Uh, have you looked at that yet? Is there uh, quite an impact on top sires or that's one of the questions that came in. Dave and Dan, I'll let you answer that from some of the things we've looked at. Yeah, that's always a, that's always a really tough whenever we, we all like progress, but uh, none of us like change, right? And uh, mm -hmm. so, uh, and, and as we've all been through these index changes and additions of traits and, and even, you know, adding, adding livability uh, uh, is, uh, you know, that trait, even though it was correlated 0.5 with productive life, you know, we saw some bulls that re-ranked a little bit when we added that trait. And this is no no different here. We're, gonna, we're putting a small amount of weight on this these calf traits, and it's, it's going to perturb the rankings a little bit. Obviously, uh, again, based on the correlations we've been hinting at, I, I think we've made it pretty clear that there's some animals in the, that are currently top-ranking animals that are very, very good for these calf wellness traits. Uh, and fortunately, uh, there's also some top-ranking animals right now that are quite not good. <laughs> so, uh, again, most are somewhere in the medium. It's a nice bell-shaped curve, as you guess. And again, uh, we're going we're gonna to change things up. It's going to change our, our focus a little bit on some of our animals, what we thought of them. And uh, as we said, it's all about moving the, the needle forward. Again, think about what we do today for this, right? Uh, as someone who has sold a few bulls to the bull studs, uh, all the thing we do is do a physical on the calf, and we know the heritability traits are, are very low. Uh, so now we're going to have this, uh, we know with low heritability traits, the genomic predictions give us uh, far more pop than with high heritability traits. So we're, we're definitely going to have some real insights uh, to both the, uh, the sires and dams that we choose for our next generation. And uh, uh, we will see some re-ranking. That's just par for the course. But that we expect, we estimate the current correlation, just like all things, for the whole population, the correlation is quite large, high. Uh, but when you start getting into those very high animals, uh, uh, you know, the correlation is, is tough to estimate. And as someone who tries to make breeding decisions on that, I always find it nice to, if there's a top list or somewhere I could find lists of top sires for different traits. Well, you do have the the dairy wellness profit dollar list. Will there be a list for the calf wellness uh, top sires as well, or not available? Yeah. Yep, we'll make that available just like the dairy wellness profit dollar and the wellness trait dollar index. So we'll have that available for the bulls starting in April. Okay, and then I've had a couple questions and come in. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I would say that'll be on the whole Steam USA website. And then I've had a couple questions come in, some people just wanting some understanding so that uh, the calf wellness traits will be part of the Clarified Plus test going forward, or is it a separate uh, test or a separate uh, level of test that they, people have to, the producers have to do? Yeah, no, it's um, kind of a win-win for producers this time around. Uh, those that have been using Clarified Plus and those going forward, there's no extra cost for this, so you're getting even more value from uh, something that they've, they've had in the past. So it's one of the benefits of being part of Clarified Plus from the get-go is you're going to, you know, have the advantage of some new things potentially coming in. Um, and so, uh, yeah, no extra cost. In fact, we lower the price just a uh, dollar um, the beginning of the year. And uh, so even more bang for the buck for dairy producers. So just to be clear uh, on that, Andrew, any, any animal that was tested previously on Clarified Plus, uh, 
our producers can uh, log on to Enlight right now and look up that animal, and they will see uh, that they not only have the cow wellness traits, but now they have the calf traits available on those animals uh, today. They don't need to have to, and going forward, they don't need to check any extra boxes or anything. It's just Clarify Plus gives you all of the traits now going forward. Okay, great. And as I'm checking just for here some more questions, uh, there is another question that has come in around the, you know, there is a wealth of information coming out <laughs> in April here, uh, both yourselves bringing the new calf wellness traits, and as we know, there's some uh, new health evaluations from uh, CDCB coming out in, that come online in April as well. Um, Maybe you can help people understand how they could work together or how this works or how, how you would see the people or how C producers would be uh, leveraging all this information to maximize mm -hmm. their breeding programs. So it, there's probably a lot of questions in there, and I'll have Dan and Dave help me uh, answer part of that. But, um, you know, I think in our index, again, kind of comes down to what index that you're going to use to rank your animals. And uh, so we've built already in five of the six traits that will be introduced from the Council Dairy Cattle Breeding. So we've already got mastitis, um, uh, metritis, RPDA, ketosis. Um, we have lameness. That is the second most important trait um, from a profitability or, you know, from a cost perspective and a disease um, in lameness. So we've got that one in, in our index. We've got the calf wellness trait index. So or in information going in. So um, you know, I, there's there's multiple ways producers can do it. So they can they can utilize our dairy wellness profit dollars, which is still going to be the most comprehensive index available commercially. Um, net merit dollars, for example, will not include any of the new traits that they have at least in April. Um, they're still evaluating that, and so um, and even when it does, there'll still be some traits in there that are not. Um, that are not in there as compared to what the dairy wellness profit dollars is. If somebody wants to use, for example, TPI or net merit as a starting point, they of course could um, build a custom index that includes then our wellness traits and or calf wellness traits into that as well. But <clears throat> we do have basically the the real strong, I guess, influential traits in there. Um, already, so it'll be the customer's decision as to how they choose their bulls and their ranking of their cows, um, just like uh, just like it is today. But uh, just a little bit uh, uh, different rankings as you'll see coming out with the dairy wellness profit dollars. You know, Dan or Dave, do you have anything else to add to that? Again, I just add that you know uh, the all of our uh, reports going forward. Uh, We'll have uh, the CDCB traits. Uh, we're going to present them all. Uh, and if uh, producers choose, uh, that will be with base clarified. They will get those traits. And then if they choose to upgrade to uh, clarified plus, again, that uh, costs you about the uh, uh, same price as a, a good cup of coffee today to upgrade to clarified plus. Um, then you, you get our traits, and you can look at them side by side. We're going to have them right there. Uh, you certainly could evaluate them in, in, in your system. And then see which, uh, which is working better. You can evaluate the milk fever trait and see if that is something that is, that is really uh, uh, very critical to you or, or not. And uh, so, yeah, we're going to all learn. Uh, just like uh, the industry is, is going to decide how to how to use these uh, the CDCB traits uh, in the various indexes um, over the next few months. And perhaps you know, it gets just you know, we've, we're pretty confident in what we've got. Um, We've done a lot of research on them. We've had them for a couple of years now. Um, so, you know, we're using, I guess, our, our traits within our index at this time. Uh, we know a lot more about it. We know where heritabilities are at. Um, our reliabilities are, are strong. Um, and we've, we've gotten we've demonstrated that it works in, you know, over nearly 3,000 cows. So um, I guess we're very confident in, in what we have already available today. Great, and I think it's a great time to be a uh, dairy producer and uh, managing your herd, the wealth of information that uh, is available today and the uh, specific uh, decisions you can make uh, more accurately now is certainly going to produce uh, greater profitability in the long run. And we appreciate uh, the three of you sharing 
all this information with us. It's it's a lot to take in, but I, I think if people are wanting to watch the recording afterwards, we will be putting it out tomorrow. We do usually get about 90% of the people that uh, watch it afterwards. They can't make it for one way or another, so the recording will be available as of tomorrow morning. We'll be sending it out to everyone, plus posting it on our website. And with that, I want to thank everyone for attending today, and uh, thank you to our presenters for taking the time. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.